Gulf. We're, we're honored and privileged to have you all here at the 37th National Shakespeare Competition. I'm going to turn things over to Ms. Karen Karpowicz, who is our executive director, and she will share some opening remarks. Karen? I just want to thank everyone. And um, as you know, we live in extraordinary times, as the old proverb says, um, interesting times. And I just want to thank all of you for being able to adapt to this. And um, it's, it's creating a very positive energy around this event. Um, the event has been around since um, 1983. You know, since that time, we've, we've touched over 360,000 students, not to mention, you know, 20,000 teachers and everyone else who has come through this program. So this is, this is, this is an exciting year for us. Even though you're all not here in New York, it would have been lovely to have you here in New York. We were planning to be at the Public Theater this year, but hopefully next year we'll be back at the Public. We're also learning an incredible amount about um, how to improve the program. And we're really excited over the audience participation, the audience favorite award. That has really been a really big success. And the number of people who participated in it have voted has really kind of, you know, really kind of made a statement about how important this program is. So at this point, um, I was wondering if Paul Beresford Hill would like to say hello. He'll be back later when we, you know, when we announce our um, actual winners, he'll be making a statement then, but I just wanted to introduce him now and him to say hello to everyone. Paul? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes. Good. Yes. Good. good. Uh, just really to, be, to start off by giving a huge round of thanks, Karen, to you and to Betty and Josh and the team at the ESU for basically engineering what I heard somebody term a technical impossibility, which is running a Shakespeare competition online. Uh, this is absolutely breaking new territory, breaking new ground. Um, and as you said, we're learning an awful lot from, from this whole experience. And I think it will, it will signify uh, a new dimension for the operation of the English Speaking Union uh, as we promote ourselves and we promote our programs through technologies which have been there for a long time, but which we haven't necessarily utilized to the fullest extent. So here goes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, very much for those kind words. And Karen, thank you so much. So to begin, just a few notes and uh, introductions and rules for our participants. So I'm reading these off a of prompter, don't judge. Alrighty. So to our judges and to our performers, if the technology fails while a student is performing, they've been instructed to have an alternate source of technology available. When they are ready to come back on, they will then be added at the end of the roster, which means if you're going whichever, in whichever position and your technology fails, just stop, disconnect, get ready to perform on your alternate form of technology. We'll put you at the end of the roster. However, if it becomes impossible for a student to join us after we've waited for an appropriate amount of time, I'm afraid the student will sadly possibly be disqualified. Unfortunately, there's just a limit of time to what we can do with technology. Uh, students who have a technological issue and then it becomes resolved should not restart they should just wait and go at the end so that they can give their best full performance judges we would ask that if a student's technology fails please make note of where you lost the performance or where the performance stopped on your notes if for some reason uh, a student isn't unable to come back however they did get through the majority of their performance. It will be at the judge's discretion if they decide to uh, adjudicate on that performance. 
if a judge loses technology and misses part of a performance, we ask then that that judge recuse themselves from that particular performance, and I will step in ex officio, <coughs> which will give my opinion, but not necessarily a vote. After each student's performance, the judges will be given about 60 seconds to complete their notes. We ask that um, they please hit the chat button and type the word ready so that we can, when we have all our judges ready, we can then signal the next student. Students, please bear in mind the rules as they were described to you. Please do not use props or clothing or hair as props as this is against the rules. And you may ask the prompter, Annalise, for a word or line by saying line. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our judges. To begin, Ms. Dana Ivey, five-time Tony nominee and star of Broadway stage and screen. Mr. Dakin Matthews, award-winning playwright and star of To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway. Ms. Eun Eunice Roberts, acclaimed performer. I'm sorry, I just received a note. Uh, Ms. Eunice Roberts, who is an acclaimed performer and playwright in her own right, and also the Dean of BADA, where our first place prize, where our first place contestant will be receiving their prize. Ms. Sarah Enlow is an NEH Fellow, 2003 Teacher of the Year, and Director of Education at the American Shakespeare Center, where our second place contestant will be uh, experiencing their prize. And finally, Ms. Katie Parker, who is a New York City High School teacher. And Katie is a big part of the ESU family. As in 2020, she was the New York City ESU T-Lab Scholar. And in 2001, as a student from our Central Florida branch, she was the National Shakespeare Competition first place winner. And now I will ask Josh Keppel Gonzalez, our communications manager, if he would so kindly turn on the camera and audio of our first performer so that the competition may begin. I would ask everyone else to please mute your microphones and turn off your video so that we can focus on the students. And without further ado, good luck, Josh. Hi, my name is Julia Kalinske, and I will be doing Sonnet 94, followed by the Jailer's Daughter monologue from Two Noble Kinsmen, Act 2, Scene 4. Thank you. They that have the power to hurt will do none. That do not do the things they most do show. Who, moving others, are themselves as stone. Unmoved. Cold, to temptation slow. They rightly do inherit heaven's graces and husband nature's riches from expense. They are the lords and owners of their faces, others but stewards of their excellence. The summer's flowers to the summer sweet, though to itself it only live and die. But if that flower with base infection meet, the basest weed outbraves his dignity. For the sweetest things turn sour by their deeds. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. Why must I love this gentleman? Tis odds, he never will affect me, for I am base. My father, the mean keeper of his prison, and he, a prince. To marry him is hopeless. To be his whore is witless out upon it. And what 
pushes are we wenches driven to when fifteen once has found us? First, I saw him. I seen he thought he was a goodly man. He has as much to please a woman in him if he pleased to bestow it as so. His eyes yet looked on. Next, I pitied him, and so would any young wench. Though my conscience that never dreamed or vowed her maidenhood to a young, handsome man. Then I loved him. Extremely loved. Infinitely loved him. What can I do to make him know that I love him, for I would fain enjoy him? Well, say I venture to second grade. What says the law then? Oh, well, thus much from law or kindred, I will do it. And this night, or tomorrow, he shall love me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hayden Mays. I will be performing Sonnet 17 and The Tempest, Act 2, Scene 2, Caliban. Who will believe my verse in time to come if it were filled with your most high deserts? Though yet heaven knows it is but as a tomb which hides your life and shows not half your parts. If I could write the beauty of your eyes and in fresh numbers number all your graces, the age to come would say, this poet lies. Such heavenly touches, ne'er touched earthly faces. So should my papers yellowed with their age be scorned like old men of less truth than tongue and your true rights be termed a poet's rage and stretched meter of an antique song. But, were some child of yours alive that time, why you should live twice, in it and in my rhyme. Ugh. All the infections that the sun sucks up from bogs, fens, flats, on Prosperfold, and make him by inch meal a disease. Oh, the spirits hear me, and yet I needs must curse. But them nor pinch, fright me with urchin shows, pitch me in the mire, nor lead me like a firebrand in the dark out of my way, unless he bid him. But for every trifle are they set upon me. Sometimes like apes that mow and chatter at me, and after bite me. Then, like hedgehogs which lie tumbling in my barefoot way, and mount their pricks and my footfall. This may be the guy from Jersey. Sometimes am I all wound with adders, who, with cloven tongues, do hiss me into madness. Oh, now look, here comes a spirit of his, and to torment me for bringing wood in slowly. I'll fall flat, perchance he will not mind me. Thank you.
Oh, hateful hands, to tear such loving words, I'll get these several paper for amends. Look, here is writ, kind Julia. Unkind Julia? As in revenge of thy ingratitude, I throw thy name against the bruising stones, trembling contemptuously from thy disdain. And here is writ, love wounded Proteus, poor wounded name. My bosom as a bed shall lodge thee till thy wound be thoroughly healed. And thus I search it with a sovereign kiss. But twice or thrice was Proteus written down. I'll be gone, good wind. Blow not a word away till I have found each letter in the letter. Except my own name. Lo, here in one line is his name twice writ. Poor, poor Lord Proteus. Passionate Proteus to the sweet Julia. That I'll tear away, and yet, I will not, since so prettily he couples it to his complaining names. Thus will I fold them one upon another. Now kiss, embrace, content, do what you will. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adam Wilson. And today I'll perform Richard from Richard the Third, Act One, Scene One, followed by Sonnet Nine Four. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to see my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. <laughs> Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, one against the other. 
And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarice closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer shall be. Some glory in their birth, some in their skill, some in their wealth, some in their body's force, some in their garments, though newfangled ill, some in their hawks and hounds, some in their horse. And every humor hath his adjunct pleasure, wherein it finds a joy above the rest. But these particulars are not my measure. All these I better in one general best. Thy love is better than high birth to me, richer than wealth, prouder than garments costs, of more delight than hawks and horses be. And having thee, of all men's pride I boast, wretched in this alone, that thou mayest take all this away, and me most wretched may. Thank you. Hello, my name is Charity Meridor. I will be performing Sonnet 138, followed by Romeo and Romeo and Juliet. When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. And she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties. Thus, vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best. Simply, I credit her false speaking tongue. On both sides, thus is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. An age in love loves not to have yours told. Therefore, I lie with her. And she with me. And in our faults by lies, we flattered be. But soft, but like the yonder window brace. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Her eyes, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, was already sick and pale with grief that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. It is, my lady. Oh, it is, my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. <clears throat> I am too bold. It is not to me she speaks. Two of the fair stars in all the heaven having some business do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there? They in her head. 
the brightness of her cheeks would shame those stars as daylight doth a lamp. Her eye in heaven would through the air region stream so bright the birds would sing and think it were not night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, if I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. Thank you. Hello, my name is Max Mester. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I will be doing Benedict's monologue from Much Ado About Nothing, followed by Sonic 129. I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will, after he had laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. And such a man is Claudio. May I be so converted and see with these eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn, but love may transform me to an oyster, but I'll take my oath on it. Till he hath made an oyster of me, he shall never make me such a fool. <laughs> One woman is fair. Uh, yet I am well. Another is wise. Yet I am well. Another virtuous. Yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be. That's certain. Wise or I'll none, virtuous, or I'll never cheapen her. Fair, or I'll never look on her. Mild, or come not near me. Noble, or not I, or an angel. Of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair eh, shall be of what color please God. <laughs> huh. The prince and Monsieur Love. I will hide me in the arbor. Expense of a spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. And till action, lust is perjured. Murderous, bloody, full of blame, a savage, extreme, rude, cruel. Not to trust. Enjoy no sooner but despise it straight. Past reason hunted and no sooner had. Past reason hated as a swallow bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad, mad in pursuit and in possession so. Had having and in quest to have. Extreme. A bliss and proof. And proved. A very well. Before a joy proposed. Behind a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this.
Hi, my name is Jordan Jenkins, and I am going to be playing Jailer's Daughter from Two Noble Kinsmen, followed by Sonnet 127. Oh, why should I love this gentleman? Uh, Tis odd he never will affect me. I am base. My father, the mean keeper of his prison, is he a prince? Uh, to marry him is hopeless to be his whore. Is witless consequence. Oh, what pushes are we wenches driven to when fifteen once it is found out? First I saw him. I, seeing, thought he was a goodly man. He has as much to please a woman in him if he means to bestow it so, as ever these eyes yet looked on. Uh, next, I pity him. And so in a young wench, oh my conscience that ever dreamed or vowed her maidenhead to a young, handsome man. Then I loved him. Extremely loved him, infinitely loved him. Oh, what shall I do to make him know that I love him, for I would fain enjoy him? Say I venture to set him free. That says the law then. Thus much for law or kindred. I will do it. And this night or tomorrow, he shall love me. In the old age, Black was not counted fair, or if it were, it bore not beauty's name. But now is black beauty's successive heir, and sweet beauty slandered with a bastard shame. For since each hand hath put on nature's power, bearing the foul of art's false borrowed face, sweet beauty. Hath no name, no holy dower, but is profane, if not this in disgrace. Therefore, my mistress's eyes are raven black, her eyes so sweet, and they, mourners seen, that such who, not born fair, no beauty lack, slandering creation with a false esteem. Yet so they mourn, becoming of their woe, that every tongue says beauty should look so. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kyle Williams. Today I will be performing Othello from Othello, followed by Sonnet 46. is the cause. It is the cause of my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. It is the cause. Yet I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that white of skin of her so smooth as a monumental alabaster. Yet she must die. Else she'll betray more men. Put out the light. And then... Put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me. When I pluck the rose, I can 
not given by the world. Hi, my name is Adina Kazaku Deluca. I will be reading Isabella from Measure for Measure, followed by Sonnets 147. Most strange, yet most truly will I speak. That Angelo's forsworn? Is it not strange? That Angelo's a murderer? Is it not strange? <laughs> that Angelo is an adulterous thief? A hypocrite? A virgin violator? Is it not strange? And strange? Is it not truer he is Angelo? Then, this is all as true as it is strange. Nay, it is ten times true. For truth is truth to the end of reckoning. O oh, Prince, I conjure thee, as thou believest there is another comfort than this world, that thou neglect me not with that opinion that I am touched with madness. Make not impossible that which but seems unlike. Tis not impossible, but one, the wickedest caitiff on the ground, may seem as shy, as grave, as just, as absolute as Angelo. Even so, may Angelo, in all his dressings, carracks, titles, forms, be an arch villain. Believe it, royal prince. If he be less, he's nothing, but he's more. Had I 
more name for badness. My love is as a fever, longing still for that which longer nurseth the disease, feeding on that which doth preserve the ill, the uncertain sickly appetite to please. <laughs> my reason, the physician to my love, angry that his prescriptions are not kept, hath left me and I, desperate, now approve, desire is death, which physic did accept. Past cure I am. Now reason is past care, and frantic mad with evermore unrest. My thoughts and my discourse as madmen are, and random from the truth vainly expressed. For I have sworn thee fair and thought thee bright, who art as black as hell, as dark as night. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sophie Bird, and today I will be doing Sonnet 138, followed by Juli Portia from Julius Caesar. Thank you. When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her. Though I know she lies, that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties. Thus, Mainly thinking, she thinks me young. Although she knows my days are past my best, simply I credit her false speaking tongue. On both sides, thus, is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore say she, not she, is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? Oh, love's best habit is conceiving trust. In age and love loves not to have years old. Therefore, I lie with her and she with me. And in our faults by lies, we flatter be. What? Is Brutus sick? And will he steal from his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night, and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No. My prudence, you have some sick offense within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And on my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love, and that great vow that did incorporate and make this one that you unfold to me. Yourself, your half. Why you are heavy? And what men have had to resort to you tonight? For here have been some six or seven that did hide their faces even from the darkness. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our performances. At this time, I'll be taking the judges into a separate meeting room where they will deliberate and return with our winners. In the meantime, though, I would ask, please, if all of you, wherever you are, could join us in giving these students a big round of applause because they Everyone. Yeah. Really great. Good job. Good job. It really did. What a joy. It was wonderful to be able to attend. Well, thank you. Can you can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm Paul Beresford Hill. I'm the chairman of the uh, English Speaking Union, and it's been. Uh, a great pleasure today to, um, to, to hear and see all of you uh, in this very, very exciting and unusual competition. When, uh, when I started the Shakespeare competition in 1983, uh, I really didn't have any ideas to the number of students across America whose knowledge and love of Shakespeare would be encouraged by this effort. And, uh, you know, now in a global pandemic, 37 years later, uh, I'm equally amazed that even a global pandemic can't stop the power and influence of Shakespeare from allowing young adults like yourselves to take his words, to interpret them, and then present them to the world. 2020 is a long way from 1592, 1603 or 1604. Those were the years when great plagues hit London and they were supposed to be caused by an infection which traveled to Merry England from overseas, much like COVID-19 arriving on our shores. And Shakespeare, the playwright and actor, no doubt, was quarantined and in all probability, the plague of 1592, which lasted two years and others that came after it, gave him great opportunities to lock himself away, ponder the human condition, and get busy writing plays. Now, London civic leadership at the time wrote the following message to its citizens. Quote, we are concerned that people are flocking to the, sound, to the town to see certain stage plays, <laughs> or with thereby creating a great infection with the plague or some other infectious diseases that might arise and grow to the great hindrance of the Commonwealth of the city. Well, Shakespeare never actually wrote a play about plagues or pandemics, but he does refer to them frequently. In his poem, Venus and Adonis, for instance, Venus begged the kiss from Adonis, quote, to drive infection from the dangerous year because, she claims, the plague is banished by thy breath. Well, perhaps this was an early in advertisement for gargling with disinfectant. I really wonder about that. And we all know the great lines from Romeo and Juliet, a plague on both your houses, and of course the quarantined time of Athens cursing the Athenians by wishing that breath infect breath at their society as their friendship may merely poison. And even Macbeth questioning his killing of Duncan fears that the plague may infect him. And then we look at the cause, causes and consequences that are troubling our lives and think back to one Elizabethan clergyman who had a very, very simple explanation for all of it. He said, the cause of plagues are sin, and the cause of sin are plays. And ipso facto, the cause of, play, of plagues are plays. Well now, according to that logic, the current closure of Broadway is a clear indication that sin is on the wane, and we will soon be set free. And I'm gonna set you free now from the anxiety that's been uh, abounding around uh, the internet, the play's the thing. You contestants have done a brilliant job inspiring us 
this afternoon. And each one of you, in my opinion, are winners. But alas and alack, we ha have only a small number of prizes to share with you all. And so without further ado, I'm going to announce our third prize winner is Jordan Jenkins. Jordan, congratulations. Well done. A great effort and a very, very enjoyable, very, very enjoyable presentation you gave. Thank you. The second prize winner is Adam Wilson. Adam, are you there? If you are, thank you very much. No, there you go. That was a really, really good piece of work you did. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm glad. Congratulations to you. Well, well, well done. And now our first prize winner is Miss Ava Bloom. Not at all, not at all, not at all. It was, a, it was a lovely, lovely presentation you gave. Really professional and eloquent and elegant. Thank you and, so much. I'm quite sure that the judges um, made, their, made their choice uh, very, very wisely. And I'd also like at this moment to congratulate your teacher, uh, Jim Mahady. Yay! Yay! Really a great, a great uh, round of applause for, for the teachers. Behind every successful student, there are some really great teachers. And so uh, without further ado, I will close the session by congratulating you all, by thanking our judges. Thank you very, very much indeed for your time, for your energy, for your effort, and for making this unique opportunity and unique experience, uh, all the more unique by your wisdom and uh, your vision and your care for these young people. And uh, I, thank, I thank all of you. Um, thank you to the ESU. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, uh, everybody who has made this event. And uh, Josh, thank you very much for keeping us technologically online, uh, in control, and uh, it was great that we got everybody together. So again, thank you all very much indeed. Congratulations to the winners and congratulations to the ESU. Thank you. And um, just thank very you. quickly, um, if Betty Roth, I think Betty has something else to add. Yes, just very quickly. Paul, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Um, just to let all of our uh, students know that there are a few more surprises coming we couldn't give you the weekend that we wanted to give you, but we are planning on having a few more fun things happen during the course of the spring and summer, and we hope that you'll play along with us and, and everything will come out great. Uh, there is one other thing that we need to announce, and that is the winner of our People's Choice Award, oh. who happens to be one of you. Uh, is Karen there? Karen, did, do you have the information? Would you like to announce that? Karen? Hello? Am I on? Hi. Hey, Karen, Hi. yes. <laughs> Did you get the email with the information? Yes. Um, Would you be kind enough to please announce the People's Choice winner? Yes, I'd like to announce, and this was after receiving 9,000 votes. Oh, as I will imagine. Wow. 9,000 people <laughs> voted. And the winner is Max Meister. Oh! Oh my goodness, Max. Good well good done, sir. Well done. Thank you. Max, well I, done. And I think, I think that's a thousand dollar prize, correct, Betty? Correct. Yes, it is. Okay. So all, I'm so sorry, Karen. Um, I'm gonna pass it back to Karen in just a second, but first, just a little bit of business. Who have won? I will be in touch with you, not to worry. The rest of you, we are still with you over the summer. Uh, because as far as we're concerned, 
us. The sound is going um, on. Karen, would you like to sign us out, please? Yes, I just want to oh, thank everyone. Karen, there she is. I want to thank everyone and I want to thank them for their patience. It's one thing if we're mulling around Lincoln Center, but <laughs> we're staying at home. No. Um, and I think, I, I think everyone was wonderful and thank, it was so exciting to have this many people participate. I think we had over 60 people online at one point. So thank you again to the community at large and to the winners and we look forward to the future. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Press releases uh, will be available in the next couple of days. And look for some emails and some other things. And then I think that's it. Thank you, Betty.